Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Holly Rosewood, the Outreach Coordinator at the Pulitzer Center. As we wait for more folks to join us, please let us know in the chat where you're joining from. If you haven't joined us before, the Pulitzer Center is a nonprofit journalism and education organization. We support more than 170 reporting projects each year in collaboration with news outlets around the world, then work with classrooms uh, and other public audiences to spread that work with the public. Hey, Evans, you're joining us from Minnesota. Uh, we're based in Washington, DC, but our staff and our work are global. A few logistics before we start today's conversation. You'll see the Q&A logo icon at the bottom of your screen. You can begin adding your questions there for our speakers at any time. Um, there's also a chat icon on your screen. And besides letting us know where you're joining from today, we'd appreciate it if you save that for technical questions throughout our conversation. Um, we also want you to let you know that we are recording this conversation and we'll post it online so you can watch it again uh, or share it with folks in your networks. And finally, please stay with us for a few minutes after today's conversation for a brief survey. Now I would like to introduce today's speakers. Will Sands is a documentary photographer and journalist based in Richmond, Virginia. His work focuses on social movements and political uprisings. He is the co-founder of the Fractures Collective and his work has been published in a variety of media outlets, including the Washington Post, Mother Jones and Harper's Magazine, among others. Neil Corney is a research associate at the Omega Research Foundation. He focuses on the manufacture, trade, and use of military, security, and police weapons worldwide, including identification of weapons used to violate international humanitarian and human rights law. Finally, we'll have another panelist, hopefully joining us shortly, Latoya Ratliff. She's a Florida-based nonprofit grant writer. In 2021, she received the Community Pillar Award from the Gwen S. Cherry Black Women's Lawyer Association for her community advocacy work in South Florida. So if you see LaToya join us uh, in today's conversation, she's supposed to be here. Uh, don't, no worries there. And um, we'll include her in the conversation as well. Uh, before we dive into things, into our conversation, Neil, I kind of want to ask you uh, what may seem like a really basic question, but could you just share with the audience, what are less lethal weapons? Sure, thanks. And I'm joining from the UK, just to let everybody know. I'm not US based, but Manchester in the UK, but we are global. So um, this isn't um, a straightforward subject, actually, strangely as it may seem, very complex subject, but in terms of what less lethal weapons are, um, there are a lot of debates around this and the terminology is very important but essentially a range of weapons ammunition munitions and devices uh, that are designed to have temporary or reversible effects and they're designed to present a lower risk of death or serious injury uh, than is lethal force essentially firearms but of course any force can be uh, lethal can be fatal, and some less lethal weapons certainly present a high risk of injury um, or death and also misuse. So it covers um, anything from, you know, batons, the sort of uh, typical thing that uh, virtually all law enforcement officials worldwide would have, uh, some sort of baton or striking implement through chemical irritants, um, so chemicals like CS, OCCN, that tear gas type of thing, as well as pepper um, and newer forms of chemical irritant. Um, electric shock weapons such as the taser weapon, which is a very well known one, but also other um, forms of electric shock. Um, and then particularly um, one of the things that we've seen huge rise recently is the um, launched impact munitions, so kinetic impact projectiles. So that could be a whole range of things, rubber, plastic, even wood is used um, singly or multiple projectiles launched. And then you're going into things uh, sort of maybe less common in the US, water cannon, 
um, and other directed energy, which is a newer type of um, less lethal weapon, um, and acoustic sort of type of effects or optical effects, so dazzling lasers and things like that. So a, a wide range of different uh, weapons and devices. Thank you, Neil. And, you know, for today's conversation, um, you know, given Will's project that really focuses on um, these weapons in, in the US, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, where some members of today's audience uh, might see them used and, and the relevance today, um, at least in the US. Sure. Well, I think um, one thing to say is that whilst, I mean, they have been around for many, many years, um, if we look at the last five to 10 years, their use has increased hugely. Um, now in the US, you um, are either blessed or cursed, depending on which um, side of the fence you might um, come from, with maybe almost 20,000 police departments, some of the biggest in the world, and some are possibly the smallest in the world, some very small ones. Now, almost all of them have you know, policies and procedures and guidance, that sort of thing, which which varies. So um, a lot of where we see less lethals at the moment is being driven by the companies. The US has some of the largest manufacturers, combined systems, uh, non-lethal technologies, defense technologies, and a couple of, you know, others, but they are some of the biggest in the world. So a lot of the supply is to the US forces, police departments, as well as a lot of export. Um, so, you know, almost all police departments would have would have something, even if it is just the baton and some spray. But over the years in the States, it's been widely deployed, even though perhaps we haven't seen until about, you know, 2020 and the Black Lives Matter protests, the really widespread use in response to to almost nationwide protests, whereas in other countries, we've seen for many years um, increasing amounts and, and going from you know police office police forces maybe having them in their arsenals and using them very rarely to now a real sort of uptick in their use to the tens and hundreds of thousands of you know tear gas projectiles or uh, you know impact projectiles rubber plastic bullet type of things so you could see them used virtually anywhere on the streets um, at any protest uh, certainly widespread use in in the prison system in the states and huge problems there and also you know some use on in one-on-one -on -one type of encounters with perhaps armed individuals and that sort of thing where there is you know more justification for the use perhaps if they are appropriate and they're used in line with you know, uh, proper guidelines and oversight and accountability. Thank you, Neil. And I think we'll get into those guidelines and oversight accountability uh, later in our conversation. But Will, um, you shared in your writing, your photography, your experience with less lethal weapons as a protester uh, and victim before becoming a journalist. Could you tell us a little bit about that, please? Yeah. Um, so, I think I would probably like to start with the injury just because that was the, the, the impetus for a lot of this reporting and this reporting project for Pulitzer. Um, so on the 30th of May, 2020, um, while covering the protests for racial equality uh, in the wake of George Floyd's murder outside the White House in, in Washington, DC, um, I was shot with a, uh, what I now think was a, a stinger round produced by Defense Technologies, uh, 37 millimeter canister. Fortunately, it, the impact was the actual canister and not the, the, the shrapnel that usually these rounds give off. Um, I suffered an immediate detachment of my, of my retina, partial detachment of my retina, um, some hemorrhaging in the back of the eye and some lacerations of, the, of my cornea. Um, and then within 36 hours, I was, you know, under the knife and, um, had the retina reattached, um, uh, the hemorrhaging removed and, and a, a scleral buckle, a permanent, uh, um, 
silicone device implanted around the eye to help with the, the recovery. Um, in the sort of long story short was that I lost most of the vision in my right eye. Um, I would probably suffer from glaucoma and cataracts and, and will have to use glasses for the rest of my life. And particularly traumatic was that it was the eye that I used for, for my photography, um, which has meant that I've had to change the, the way that I approach photography. Um, when I was shot, I just recently returned from, from Chile, a reporting project in Chile, covering the, the protests there in 2019. And one of the phenomenons that emerged in, in those protests was this blinding by police. Um, so currently we're up to about 500 plus people that have been blinded or partially blinded as a result of injuries they've sustained from less lethal weapons that were fired by the police. Um, and unfortunately, this is a, this is a phenomenon that is it's actually global. Um, and we see it in Ecuador, Colombia, uh, Lebanon, Hong Kong, uh, tragically in Kashmir, the numbers are extreme. Um, and then now the United States. Um, by by the sort of the accounts in the United States, the numbers are, are varied, but up to 90 people, I've seen reports of up to 90 people. I've been able to confirm 30. Um, and for this reporting, I focus on the stories of 15 particular individuals, um, one of which is Latoya, who is going to participate or might jump in at some point in this, in this conversation. Um, so somewhat uniquely, I spent a lot of my, my 20s in, in Barcelona involved in, in the sort of subcultures and, and protest cultures of the, of the region. And then as a result of that, had, had a fair amount of interaction with protests and with a lot of these weapon systems um, at that point as a protester. Um, and then because of the work that my focus in terms of the journalism I do, that's continued on. I've had a fair amount of interaction with, with these weapons, as I mentioned, with, with Chile. So I was fortunate in that, in two sort of realms, in that the injury itself in comparison to other people's injuries was comparably less, even though I lost a significant amount of, of vision. I retained my eye, I retained some sight. Um, but I also benefited from the fact that I had this experience um, and time covering these weapons and interacting with these weapons. So, which essentially acted as a resource. Um, and, and in comparison to other people's experience, the people that I was documenting and working with, um, a lot of people, the, the bubble was completely burst. Um, and you, the reporting itself basically became a, a, a somewhat of a therapeutic process, at least this, this first set of reporting, because as a result of the, the reporting, we created an a informal chat group that's now grown organically. I think we're up to 20 people. Um, it was originally just a couple of the people that I contacted and has, has become a space where people share their experience. Um, and in some ways it makes the, the individual trauma people are living through a little bit more manageable in that they're able to place it within this broader phenomenon. Thank you. I, you know, following up on that, I think that one of your, um, most incredible stories from this project is your photo essay uh, shot in the eye squad, which I encourage people to check out if they haven't already. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, what was your process for getting in touch with people? You know, you said you've confirmed 30, told stories of 15. How did you um, go about not only, you know, reaching out to these people and identifying them, but, um, you know, building this community that you've talked about? I'd just love to learn more about that. Um, it was obviously because of the injury, uh, the work changed. Um, so the kind of photography that I was doing before has changed. Um, and the process became much more, it slowed way down. Um, and, and honestly, this is the first project that was, that was really a personal, a personal project, um, to as much as, it, as much as it was a journalistic project, it was also a project that that had a lot to do with my experience of, of this injury and, and these weapon systems. Um, and I mean, I basically, I just reached out I mean, through social media, through you know, using the, the basic sort of reporting skills that you would use for, for any other story. The only difference was that most of the, the interviews, not most, all of the interviews were couched within 
a, a dynamic which was you know it was a back and forth it was it was more of a sharing than it was necessarily just a straightforward interview and a lot of it was comparing notes and and sort of you know because a lot of people didn't realize how many of us there were you know and that and that process in and of itself was was revealing um and then also the the photography itself i tried to explore a little bit with the way that that visually not just the 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 not just the portraits but also visually the way that our, our vision has changed um both symbolically and and you know in the actual site um so some of the images are distorted some of the images are you know double exposures or multi exposures um and just gave myself a little bit more space in terms of the creative process to, to approach this other matter. Um, and I think actually in the end, it, it, it came out really well. Um, so. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think, you know, we probably have some members of the audience who are curious about, you know, your process as a photographer mm -hmm. as well. So I hope that was helpful. Um, I actually noticed right now, you know, you were talking about this group, this community um, that you've helped to build. And I see we have a question from Linda in the chat. So I'm gonna allow her to come off mute and ask her question. I think it'd just be a great time to uh, bring her in. I'm mute. Is that correct? Did I do it? Yep, yeah. yep. Amazing. Um, I actually just wanted to really uh, gas up Will um he he was the dude that got all of us together in the, the in the group chat uh we would not have had this community without him and i can tell you specifically because i've sat on his front porch and he sat in my living room and taken just the worst photo i've ever taken in my entire life i can't even be mad at it because it's a very good photo um he has has built something here and i just wanted to like as a member of the shot in the eye squad just be right here and be like no that guy did it he is so good and i we wouldn't have this without him as far as journalistic integrity um I'm a journalist also. I think Will and I might be the only two journalists in the squad. Um, I could not give him enough awards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, and it's great to have you here as well. I, um, I, you know, just read about you and Will's work. And so it's great that you're here and I'm oh yeah I don't recommend getting shot as like a life choice try not <laughs> to get shot if you could you know avoid it but you know thank you um you know I I think that what you've also mentioned will about um you know it being a form of therapy is really important um and I like to think about we're talking about issues um, that are, you know, dangerous, that are heavy, frankly, talking about solutions is one thing that um, I find really important. Um, and I was wondering, Neil, if we could ask you a little bit about, uh, you know, reformation, regulation, um, things you see in the US or just, you know, globally, if you think that they could be good examples for what we've seen in this country. Sure. So I think um, one thing to say is that it's, it, this is a really long struggle. So I first started work in this area in Northern Ireland with the United Campaign Against Plastic Bullets over there. And, and what you've done, Will, is really powerful. It was done there with, you know, survivors of police violence coming together. Um, and, they're, and they're still working on that from the 70s to now and the, and that has changed you know there are better systems there now and that sort of thing but it came from a very a very very bad place at that time where the weapon was you know just laughably bad um you know if you looked at it you just think who on earth put that thing together um that was the rubber bullet and then the plastic bullet and then over years developments of you know the technical 
details were there to say these things were not accurate. Um, the reports had been buried. There was no transparency. Um, there were denials by, by government essentially over many, many years. And it took, you know, doctors gathering the data in the hospitals, um, painstakingly gathering that to find the injury rates and to find the types of injury, that sort of thing. And the same work is being done now, whether it's Chile, US, um, occupied Palestinian territories, France, Spain and Catalonia, many blindings there from, from a weapon in Spain, in that case, that should not be manufactured, full stop. So it's a long struggle. And um, so I've been involved, you know, for many years. And I suppose a couple of things that I'd highlight. So on the international level, um, there is some collaboration and uh, between the UK, Canada and the USA on testing of some devices. Um, and that has had some benefits, definitely. Um, in certain areas of, of less lethal uh, weapons. There's not enough, again, openness and transparency. There is um, some sort of more publications around sort of technical side and that sort of thing, but it tends to still be a little bit um, too esoteric, if you like, and not very practical. There's been a, a, a process at the United Nations. Um, so you have, on the one hand, from 1990, the United Nations basic principles on use of force and firearms, which are, are pretty strong. Even now, they need a bit of refinement updating. But they essentially say that law enforcement officials should have something other than a firearm. You should have a range of means, a broad range of means. So states should be developing this and those those means essentially less lethal weapons um, should minimize risk of injury and death and risk to bystanders um, and also you should have things in place which mean that you don't use force at all so rather than just having a load of weapons uh, and giving them out to untrained officers which is often the case you certainly should develop and test those weapons to make sure they're absolutely, you know, as safe as can be. At the moment, you have essentially devices that have been around for decades. So the tear gas, you know, projectiles type thing, or the tear gas grenades, or the kinetic impact projectiles, many of those have not changed for decades and decades. And they're based on military weapons, military munitions. Most of them are, certainly for the impact munitions, are incredibly inaccurate. Um, so if we're talking about lowering risk, there are certain things you know, that can be done there against the manufacturers. So the UN has developed this guidance on less lethal weapons in law enforcement that came out in 2020. Um, and I was part of the, the, the group of uh, experts, international experts that, that helped to develop that. So that's available online um, and we can share the link perhaps in in the chat but that gives a starting point to build from the basic principles to give a little bit more detail but then there's a lot more you know that needs to be done some of these less lethal devices just simply should not be used so any multiple projectiles for example you know that are launched they should not be used that you can't know where those are going to hit a single projectile is the only impact projectile that could be allowed. And even then, with lots of caveats, um, it has to be accurate and consistent. It has to hit where it's aimed at. Then, of course, it means your law enforcement personnel need training and that sort of thing. So, again, we see that across not just the US, but in many places. So things are introduced with no testing with no proper guidelines, certainly with no transparency or discussion with uh, communities. Um, so that sort of community-based policing idea where you start with the premise that law enforcement are there and their you know, powers are given to them by the citizens and therefore they should be answerable to the citizens and this should be discussed, you know, um, and then go on from there and then so there's a whole range of, of the less lethals that should not be used at all. And then after 
that there are a whole series of steps that could be taken testing trialing you know accountability um and penalties for any sort of misuse so there are some uh you know positives that that there is some recognition now so in the us itself there's just very recently a report out by the police executive research uh forum the called perf pr p-e-r-f sorry they've just released a report last last week which looks at some of the learning from policing over the black lives matter pro, uh, protests and and recommends that the federal authorities develop strong guidelines and do testing uh, and development work on the less lethals. But this is decades too late, in a sense, because this has been known about for decades. Maybe this will be a point where they really do start some of that work. Thank you, Neil. And I'm, you know, when I'm reading about this, um, you know, it can sometimes be very overwhelming. Um, just the scope of weapons that are used, the different regulations in each region. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, Will, you shared a little bit um, before we started today's conversation that you just finished up some reporting um, about Venom. And, you know, maybe it would be helpful for the audience to kind of narrow in on that one example. Uh, do you think you could tell us a little bit about that? Don't want to give your story away, obviously, but. No, it's, it's already submitted, so. I'm not, I'm not too worried. Um, so yeah, I, the the most recent work I've been doing as part of this project and and reporting on less lethals was focused on on the venom multi launcher. Um, as Neil mentioned before, these are inherently indiscriminate weapons. Um, so the venom multi launcher is manufactured by Combined Systems Incorporated out of Jamestown, Pennsylvania. Um, it is essentially, a, for lack of a better description, a turret. Um, that was designed to be mounted on the top of, of military vehicles um, and in theory to be used to, to extend, create a, a broader um, perimeter of security. Um, they can shoot up to 30 canisters at, at a time, um, at 37 and, and 40 millimeter canisters. And as far as I understand, and Neil, you, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, you could essentially put any 40 or 37 millimeter canister in these devices, lethal or non-lethal. I mean, that, that, that is somewhat irrelevant. Um, but in the case of, of Venom, it was used in, in Colombia um, in, in during the last spring's general strike in a mass deployment um, and particularly heavily used in, in Bogota and Popoyan. So I focused on the story of, of Sebastian Quintero uh, Muniera, who's a 28 year old um, computer engineering student who was killed by a flashbang that's been linked to, to the Venom system that was being used on that street. Um, and his death subsequently led to, to the, a partial banning of the use of that weapon. And then from there, I followed, followed Venom back to, to Jamestown, Pennsylvania, and Western Pennsylvania, which um, for the sake of my reporting, I think the, the evidence bears this out. This part of, of the United States is, is, if not the birthplace of, of the modern sort of less lethal industry, at least a very important nexus point um, in, in the history. So you originally after the, the Geneva Convention or the Geneva Protocols in 1925, banning use, the use of chemical weapons, you had the birth of federal laboratories in, in, in this part of the country, um, which were one of the first major manufacturers of, of uh, tear gas um, and primarily uh, DOD contracted with a fair amount of oversight, um, both in the manufacturing and the actual weapons that they were they were producing. Um, that is not the case today. Um, Combined Systems operates um, out of a, a basically a series of big warehouses in their their manufacturing site in rural Pennsylvania, and then non lethal Technologies is just two hours away, um, also in Western Pennsylvania, um, and they're kind of on a scale of from one being a little bit more formal and the other essentially being one, one person described non-lethal technologies to me as, as the breaking bad of, of, of weapons manufacturing. Um, so there's essentially beyond OSHA, EPA, and to some extent, some super fund regulations, 
in, in regards to the quantity of certain chemicals that may be, be used or, or in the manufacturing. That's the only regulation there is in manufacturing. In a state like Pennsylvania, which is a, a manufacturing, a, pro, a producer declare state, which essentially means that there is no oversight unless they declare what they're doing. You know, there's there's very little, and that's had serious implications both for for employees and neighbors of the of the of CSI and non lethal tech. And then on in terms of sale and, and export, um, and again Neil, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it seems to me that most uh, beyond the the export license that you would need to get from the State Department to to ship these weapons overseas. Um, there's very little licensing and regulation and, and less lethal weapons in large part are excluded from most small arms treaties that would otherwise regulate munitions and, and weapons. Um, so in a case with like, like Colombia, or even I'd argue in the case of the, the shot in the eye squad or, or myself, um, when it comes to regulation of use, there's even less. You know, we're, we're talking about basically the regulations that are set out guidelines by the UN and then individual countries interpretation of those guidelines. And then and then even on top of that, you're depending on local, you know, individual actors, how they apply the impunity that they feel, the way in which they can use those weapons. Um, and, and I'm struck by the fact that there's comparatively to other weapon systems or munitions, there's basically no there's very little research as far as I can tell in terms of the effectiveness of one weapon systems as opposed to another tactic or another strategy as it relates to, to, to crowd control. And, the, and I guess in closing, the one thing that I wanted to mention uh, after listening to Neil was that the part that kind of blows my mind of less lethal weapons, and especially if we think about something like tasers um, and the manufacturers of tasers, um, this is, they are thinking of less lethal weapons of the future of weapons, of all weapons, you know, and that, that and, and essentially that we haven't, you know, firearms have not, the general technology has not progressed since gunpowder. We're still shooting a projectile out of a tube and, and killing someone. And the vision of taser is to create weapons that would be just as effective at stopping a, a, a threat, but doing it through a means that, that doesn't kill people. And so in that sense, I think that, that less lethal weapons um, have present some really interesting and important philosophical questions that, that are relevant writ large as we think about weapons and defense and conflict and et cetera. And, I, and I'd just add, you know, that I think one of the things we've noticed over the years, so because we don't have an armed uh, police service in the UK, although the number of officers carrying firearms is increasing. So we, and a lot of groups here, have focused on less lethals, particularly coming out of Northern Ireland, the experiences there. And when we've, over the years, talked to US law enforcement personnel, they do, they've been virtually dismissive of any discussion around less lethals because they, because they face perhaps, you know, an armed, an armed assailant, so they simply go, well, if, if I don't shoot them, anything is better than shooting them, anything at all. And it's like, well, no, it's not. You still need to um, test it and regulate and that sort of thing. You know, firearms are extremely well regulated and extremely well understood. Right. You know, like you say, they've not really changed. People understand terminal ballistics of a, of a yeah. projectile and, and also they're made to really high standards. So there are international standards on ammunition manufacturing and weapon manufacturing and marking and this and that. None of that is in place for less lethals. So you could set up tomorrow as a manufacturer. Typically in the States, it's an ex-cop who has a bright idea to fix a problem and they start manufacturing some sort of device and they sell it back to their old police force because they've got friends on the police force and they go from there. Lots of these exist on websites and they sell some, but not many, but it all goes into this mix of this unregulated sort of market and it's being driven by the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And what's needed is to, is to wrest that away from the manufacturers. You know, some of the guidelines like the UN have been in place for many, many years and generally around the world, 
you know, there is some adherence to them um, and some recognition that that is a sort of good set of guidelines. But um, you have, you know, police for uh, police uh, officials in the in the US on these, you know, huge numbers of different police departments, they may be using devices that they have no legal entitlement to use because it's not in their, you know, uh, policies and procedures that's been found in the past where they buy something, they haven't even got the policies and procedures for it. So there's, it is, is a real mess, I think. Um, yeah, thank you, Neil. And, and you know, on that subject, um, you know, you're just talking about speaking with law enforcement officials. Um, we have a question in the chat about uh, the use of these weapons in prisons. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not sure, I don't recall from our earlier conversations if this is something that uh, Omega Research Foundation has looked into, but, um, you know, Julie just wants to know about, um, you know, the use of these weapons in correctional facilities um, by law enforcement. Is that something you could speak to? Yep, I mean, it's wide, it's certainly in the USA, it's very widespread. And in certain other jurisdictions in the world, it can be widespread. So for example, in Brazil, we do a lot of work there, uh, monitoring of prisons, and it's quite widespread there. So in the USA, um, I could point you to um, an appallingly named event called Mock Prison Riot, which is an industry-led exhibition and gaming uh, event for prison officials and uh, correctional officials to go and play with less lethal weapons uh, in an old prison that they've essentially purchased. And they run this every few years. It's, it's not been run due to COVID for a number of years. So that covers everything from restraint chairs to body-worn electric shock belts that you can remotely control, uh, you know, prisoners with, with, a, with a remote control and you can zap them, a remote control, to fully plumbed in systems for gassing an entire prison. Um, so there's an enormous amount of less lethal equipment that is specifically designed for correctional facilities. Now, if you're in, you know, a correctional facility, you might already be restrained. You know, you are in, in effect, you're restrained already because you're in the prison. You then might be put into cuffs and you then might have tear gas or something used against you. So there are multiple uh, risks there. And internationally, um, there are additional um, obligations on state authorities to um, you know, look after prisoners. They're deprived of their rights already. Therefore, use of force against them has an elevated status, an elevated oversight and accountability should be in place. But what tends to happen is uh, you lower the number of prison officers and you increase the number of weapons and devices to control your prisoners. And we've seen some appalling um, violations in places of detention uh, globally. Um, and that's only increased uh, under under the COVID restrictions, actually. So if, if anybody's particularly interested, then get in touch. Um, I can point you to some resources. Thank you for that, Neil. And I hope that was uh, helpful, Julie. I think also earlier, Neil, you shared some information in the chat about how to get in touch either by email or on your website. So um, thank you for that. Um, switching gears a little bit here, unless Will, you had something to add on that front. Didn't know if you wanted to jump in. Mm -hmm. um, we're starting to get some questions in the Q&A, which is really great. And if you have any, please do keep them coming. Um, we have a question uh, from Catherine, Will, about your story on the family living near the tear gas plant. Um, could you share how you found that story or you know, just some background there? Um, I came across their story through some local reporting and then spent uh, a fair amount of time going, traveling up to, to Jamestown and spending time with the Lurie family um, and learning about the, the decade, two decades and a half of, of living next to combined systems and, and, and the implications of that, uh, which was, I mean, as close to psychological torture as, 
as one could 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 call it. Um, they're they're at least until 2015, if that serves me correctly, my memory. Um, they were daily testing their munitions outdoors, um, and that can be you know up to 50 or 60 test firings a day dispersed throughout the day with no prior warning um and living less than you know 200 yards away from the testing or 300 yards away from the testing facility meant that you were you know consuming that that sound and noise all the time um and if anyone knows has been around protests where flashbangs or tear gas canisters are are, are used that's exactly what they're what they're designed to do it is it is designed to set you off and you know um essentially shock your your, your sensory system. Um, so to live next to that is crazy. And then there was um, a fair amount of tear gas residuals that were, they were consuming as a result of, of the test firing. And then their, their property, the, the woods that, of their property that was adjacent to the test firing facility was just totally littered with thousands of canisters of, of spent munitions. Um, obviously, over the property line, obviously there for a long period of time, you know, been there, deposited there, shot there over over years. Um, so just a, a general sort of indication of what combined systems sort of sense of responsibility it feels or doesn't feel to to its neighbors. Um, and then talking to subsequently in the story that I just did, talking to people that that worked at the facility, um, that was just confirmed over and over again. Um, so the number of chemical burns and or daily chemical burns, the lack of access to, to facilities for washing yourself or washing off chemical burns, um, uh, you know, inevitable building fires every year over, you know, over a decade, over a decade, you know, nine building fires. So it's just this constant sort of obvious indication of, of of the lack of sort of management and responsibility both to workers and, and neighbors um and that's that's to say nothing to their responsibility to the the people that their products are used on um so yeah thank you i you know i think it was um eye-opening for me to just read something that went beyond um these weapons as they you know, are um, handled by law enforcement officials and then victims. Um, so looking at, you know, the commercial side of things, the business side of these weapons and how it goes beyond just um, the, the use in the moment. Um, I don't know, Neil, if you have anything to add about um, I, the, oh, go ahead, Will. Can I just chime in one little thing that, that's also struck me as part of this whole process is, these are all relatively if we're, if we're talking about the arms industry and the amount of revenue that the big arms and small arms manufacturers are, are, are reeling in um, comparatively the revenue of these companies from what we can tell because it's they're totally non transparent as, as private entities um, with the exception of things that comes out through through lawsuits or through now through the the, the house subcommittees request on in their investigation of the health impacts of tear gas but besides those kind of um, release of documents, it's, it's very hard to tell how big they are. But estimating, we're pretty sure that comparatively to the rest of the, you know, the arms industry, they're, they're, they're small, you know? but they're still big enough that they're generating millions of dollars. You know? And they're big enough that they can have oversized influence in the places where they operate. Um, and they also benefit by in a certain sense, operating in this gray area, both in the regulation aspect, but also in the financial aspect where they're not too big to draw attention, um, but they're still big enough to be profitable. Um, and especially if you include a, 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 a managerial model that you know is exploitative and, and doesn't care about you know, environmental impacts or, or any of that. Um, so I just think that's important because I think that that's, that's part of why this continues to exist. If, 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 if these were you know, big mega companies in a certain sense, I think the attention might have been more. And I also think if they were, if the money was bigger, maybe the attention was more. Um, but for some reason, 
Yeah, Neil, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but just curious if you could, um, you know, provide anything that you've seen in your work as a researcher uh, in terms of people who are working on producing these weapons. I think I think Will's is exactly right. I mean, it's it's a very profitable business. It's run um, quite often with very little oversight, cutting corners, that sort of thing. We, you know, there've been many reports over the years in multiple states across the world around, you know, accidents, um, low quality products, that sort of thing, selling very high volumes of them um, and that sort of thing. And because it was generally certainly in the States, it was a sort of tick over business because you got over the years or multiple years, you would get multi-year contracts to supply the Department of Defense and, and the various multiple sort of agencies there from and then also domestic law enforcement and it would be just tick over year on year on year you had a you know a steady income and then um combined systems and non-lethal are the big exporters um from there and def tech defense technologies as it was um used to be but then contracted and is now trying to rebuild its export business so we're at, certainly in uh, you know south america um, and Asia were their big markets, and you saw it everywhere. Um, so it is very difficult to to find out much about you know their business, whilst it is licensed for export some of the products, but not all. Um, there's no publication um, around that at the moment, and then finding out the dollar value um, is very difficult. So we piece it together from contracts that are published, uh, tenders, that sort of thing. And the odd, you know, shipping manifest or cargo manifest that's found uh, quite often, you know, on the dockside or something like that, even. So in the Middle East case where we doing some work around Bahrain, um, trying to stop shipments going in there, it was a dock worker and a union worker who who released some paperwork. So globally, it's it's a very opaque business, very difficult to find out what's going on. And often it is piecing it back from what's found at the scene of a of a protest and used and lying on the ground to then tracing it back. And over many, many years, we've, you know, we know of manufacturers over many years whose products are never turned up. So they're obviously manufacturing and selling, but, you know, there's a lot of unmarked products turning up in sort of evidence. Um, you know, social media now is, is, is great. Um, lots of unmarked stuff turning up. Um, so it's a whole industry that needs to be regulated. Um, so there is, on the trade side, very, very little regulation. The US actually, bizarrely, does have, you know, some of, I would say, you know, the more effective trade controls, um, even though they don't go far enough on less lethals. But many states don't, ex you know, don't control them for export at all. So it literally is a free export, if you like. Uh, some of the, you know, grenades and that sort of thing, because they're more military in nature, do need export um, licenses. But certainly some of the newer devices um, in the less lethal area, acoustic, um, optical, directed energy, um, are not covered at all by uh, trade controls. So at the moment there's um, actually a, an, a, another UN process going on, which is developing controls um or, or looking to develop uh, international regulation of the trade in what's termed tools of torture just as a as a sort of catch-all term so that includes things that that obviously are inherently abusive and could be directly used for torture and treatment but what we're arguing um together sorry it's my dog um, with amnesty international doing some work there for a full range of law enforcement equipment to be covered by by this new international regulation but then that needs to filter down to national level and and then to local level so there is a, a lot of work uh, that could be done and just on that local level front um we might chat about it i suppose in a minute but i think that sort of local oversight and accountability structures in the uk um and in in other uh, countries 
there's some sort of citizen panels and those sort of things starting to become more active and that's maybe something that i know in the states there are there is some of that but you know just starting simply on sort of demanding to know what your local police department has what they're using where are the guidelines where are the policies and procedures who is being trained to use these things are they even trained to use them um, you know those sort of quest very basic questions but actually it's a good starting point yeah neil you kind of read my mind i was going to ask you know um since you mentioned social media uh, is being used to find out more about these weapons uh, especially ones that cannot really be identified um i was going to ask both of you you know as sort of a closing question um what people watching now, people watching this recording later might do to learn more or do more um, in their own communities. Oh, Will, you're muted. Um, I don't know, I'll be perfectly honest right now. I mean, beyond the work, I'm focusing on the work that, that I'm doing in the, at least in terms of the blinding, um, there are groups that are that are growing up, grassroots groups, wherever this phenomenon is happening, that are growing up, um, and there is a need for for resources, um, especially well, right now a little bit less so. But in Chile, at one point, there was a call for resources, um, and that's primarily organized through a group called the Coordinadora. Um, for victims of trauma oculares. So it's uh, the coordinating committee for uh, victims of ocular trauma. Um, but I think more than anything, it's just sort of the, the education outreach. And at some point, I think, I, I'm not sure we're there yet, but I think that the United States is, is working towards a space where at least some of these conversations are becoming more relevant. Um, and I think that that, is certainly true when we look at the this these two uh, subcommittee reviews of the health impacts of, of tear gas, um, which had never we had never done a, a federal evaluation of the health impacts of tear gas, and we've been using these weapons for you know what going on 80, 90 years. Um, so I think those kind of things, and and when those opportunities appear to to pressure um and move forward on those kind of initiatives i think obviously make a lot of sense yeah and i'd i'd i'd, I'd sort of completely agree with that these the sort of keying into some of the um the openings now with these investigations with this call from the police executive research forum in the states um there's you know there's a space there um to pressurize um and these, you know, just going back to Northern Ireland, these sort of things, it's it's multi-year processes. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, citizen journalism has always been really important. And social media now gives an extra boost to that um, monitoring protests um, when it's safe to do so. Um, photographs of, of what people are using. I mean, what was interesting with Black Lives Matter protests was the amount of time taken to identify what was being used and if you look and and this is something we do train photojournalists to don't take a picture of the overall scene focus in on what the officers are carrying get the serial numbers of their weapon get you know because there were some things that we used that took a long time to um to identify um but then going to each police department and demanding the tenders and the and and where their supplies are coming that sort of thing it's long laborious but you know that openness and transparency isn't going to come from the policing in the state side without really being forced to do that all of this should be open and transparent there is no reason apart from some of the tactics which you could argue might you know police forces might keep um confidential because otherwise they're giving away some of the tactics but the guidelines for how these things are used exactly what is used the material safety data sheet um, all of these things um, should be public i mean it helps you know openness transparency. it helps people who are treating um particularly when it comes to chemical um the effects of chemical irritants you need to know what is in this and companies go from a very low percentage 
to huge percentages of chemical irritants. There's no standard there either. So you might be being no, no, standard, no standard between companies either. So not at all. Totally different. Yeah. And you, and you could literally be getting an overdose yeah. um, where some of these things are being used. So um, I think in terms of that, sort of the monitoring of protests, the, the chipping away at, at police departments, asking these questions, relate it to, at the moment, the international UN standards, because there are no technical standards on almost any of this equipment. There are some potentially in development in the States uh, uh, through the ASTM. And there are some at the NATO level, but those are sort of defense standards and they need to be technical manufacturing and use standards across the board for every single less lethal. Thank you both um, so, so much. Um, for those of you in the audience who haven't checked out Will and Neil's work, um, highly encourage you to. I feel like every time I look over things, um, I learn something new and as we know, uh, the situation is always changing. So on, I look forward to seeing what you both uh, come up with in the future. Um, again, those of you in the audience, we really, really appreciate you joining us today. Um, I think it's really been a great conversation, no doubt, um, fulfilled by the questions that you shared. So uh, if you are able, we'd really appreciate you becoming a Pulitzer Center champion today. You can visit pulitzercenter.org slash give. And if you're interested in other upcoming Pulitzer Center events, you can visit pulitzercenter.org slash events. Um, again, thank you to everyone for joining us today. Uh, it's really been a pleasure. I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon, Neil, a great rest of your evening. Um, and take care. Thanks very much. And everybody take care if you're going on a protest. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Take